All right, welcome everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And I'm here today with Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren F. Klein, the co-authors of Data Feminism. Um, we're really excited to be doing this Crowdcast luncheon with all of you. Um, we're trying to see what the best way to celebrate books that are coming out during quarantine uh, is and so we're we're mixing it up. So we're doing some events in the evening and some events during the day. We're really thrilled that 134 of you can gather with us at this lunchtime event. If you know of anyone who wanted to be here but isn't able to watch it live with us, just know that you'll be able to watch it immediately after this on the um, rebroadcast. And uh, we're going to encourage folks to start putting your questions in the ask a question section at the bottom of their screen. Um, you can also engage with one another in the chat. I see some of our longtime uh, friends already in the chat. So Ann Pollock, who is a fellow um, science, science author and longtime Kara Circle board member and friend is here. Ann Zacharias Walsh, who is a current Kara Circle board member is here. Um, so it's many, many areas of overlap in our academic and uh, feminist community. We're thrilled to have you all on the chat. Feel free to say hi to one another, start asking questions. There's a link to buy data feminism at the bottom of the page. We want to let you know that something there's a very special component to this event, which is that Lauren and Catherine um, are donating part of the proceeds from their royalties to Keras Circle um, as part of their feminist project. So um, it's very, it, people don't do that. <laughs> I'll just say like they're they're living their feminism through their um, through their academic work. That's a very rare and generous thing. We are really honored uh, to have been chosen as the beneficiaries of the royalties. Um, it means a lot to us, and um, it's yet another way that this project really is living into the work that they are writing about. So we know that this is going to be a special hour. We hope that you will um, just engage with it at multiple levels. We'll be pulling your questions in throughout. We're going to um, let Lauren and Catherine have uh, a discussion first, and then we'll start bringing the questions in um, towards about the halfway point. So I'm going to minimize myself. I'm going to welcome Catherine and Lauren. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, ER. And um, yeah, we're hoping to raise millions and millions of dollars through those royalties. So uh, click the buy it now button. <laughs> there. You, can, you can contribute to those millions of dollars. <laughs> um, I'm just going to share our presentation. We have a brief presentation that we want to give today before we open it up. Oops, wait, wrong one. We have a brief presentation and then that's one I think. Yes, there we go. Um, so is that looking good, ER, just to confirm? Yes. Screen? Okay, super. That's great. Excellent. Um, so, so yeah, this was supposed to be, so my name is Catherine um, Dignazio, and this was to be our book launch in Atlanta. I was going to be flying down to Lauren's hometown, and we were going to be speaking at the bookstore. Um, and unfortunately, we can't do that, but we're super excited to be um, hosting, hosted virtually by the bookstore um, and to have everybody join that way. Um, so just as a little bit of background, um, I am a newly actually an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT, and I run a lab called the Data Feminism Lab. And uh, Lauren. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Klein. It's really nice to see so many names and uh, friendly faces in the chat. Um, I. Uh, I'm also uh, new in my position at Emory University. I uh, work between two departments, English and a department called Quantitative Theory and Methods, which is essentially a, a fancy data science department. Um, but before that, I worked for many years at Georgia Tech um, with Ann Pollock and Susanna Morris, um, proud Keras board members. Um, and I just, I feel like, you know, like Catherine said, we had really um, wanted to make this a celebratory event in person. Um, in part because, you know, Keras is one of those places that when I first moved down to Atlanta from New York, um, you know, this was at this point a long time ago, 2011. Um, and I was sort of, I was really looking for places that, um, you know, would make Atlanta feel special for me. And when I walked into Keras for the first time, the, the old location, 
um, you know, I was like, wow, this is a place, um, it, it is a really special place um, and it seemed so unique to Atlanta and I'm just really glad that um, we could do our book launch, if not in person at Keras, now at Agnes Scott, then online and be able to bring in people from around the world. Um, okay, so I think that's everything I wanna say about uh, uh, me. <laughs> Great, so um, we're just gonna speak for about 15 or 20 minutes just about some of the motivations um, for the book and setting some of the terms of conversation and giving you a couple of examples that come out of the book. Um, <clears throat> so we see data feminism as part of really a growing body of work that's holding corporate and government actors accountable for their racist, sexist, classist, and so on data products. Um, and so you can see some of the work that was inspirational for us is here on the bottom of this slide. Um, and so that's, it, this is some of the work that's been documenting some of these um, uh, oppressive data products. So there are things like face detection systems that can't see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools, search algorithms that circulate negative stereotypes about black girls, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents, data visualizations that reinforce the gender binary, all these things and more. And so um, we see this sort of big gap between, on the one hand, what has been the hype around big data. Um, and so you see this sort of, the, it's, it's epitomized here in this quote uh, that is kind of now a meme, data is the new oil. So this was originally something put forth by The Economist magazine, and then it was like really picked up. It, it seemed to be a metaphor that had a lot of, a lot of resonance, particularly like kind of in uh, corporate and business sectors who are talking about AI um, uh, and, and data as um, something like oil, which can be mined, which can be extracted, and which then can be um, processed in some way and turned into profit. But of course, the question is profit for whom? <laughs> um, and it's mostly profit of the people who are speaking here. So these uh, CEOs, mainly sort of elite white men and companies in the global north. Um, but the folks here whose work we've highlighted, and we certainly see data feminism also in this vein, are pushing back on narratives like that and saying, um, in fact, data is the same old oppression. It's just uh, clothed in slightly new garb. Um, there's different words to talk about it, like algorithms and so on. Um, but it's it's like reinscribing the same structural forces of inequality that have always um, kind of been with us. Um, and so we see this pushback coming from women of color, from white women, from indigenous folks, immigrant communities, LGBTQ people, and more. This is sort of how we would situate the book. Um, and what we bring to this conversation is a particular focus on feminism um, and on intersectional feminism in particular. Um, but we wanted to sort of do a little bit of level setting about feminism. We know that everyone brings sort of their own genealogy and their own experience of feminism sort of to the table. And so we wanted to do just some level setting to tell you about ours. Um, so in the year 2017, Miriam Webster actually made feminism its uh, word of the year, interestingly. Um, and we want to just kind of tell you what definition we're using here. So um, a feminist uh, following Beyonce, among others, is the person who believes in equal rights for men and women and non-binary people. So first of all, feminism is a belief and it's a belief in equal rights. Um, secondly, feminism is organized activity on behalf of those rights. So it's like if you look around and you believe in equal rights, you see all of this evidence for this idea that um, those are not made manifest in the world. We haven't realized that as a goal and an aspiration. And so thus, we have to take action. Um, so feminism is a belief and it's also action, organized activity on behalf of those rights. Um, but then finally, feminism is also um, this tremendous sort of intellectual heritage. And so here I want to turn it to Lauren uh, to continue on that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, right. As Catherine was just saying, so feminism is also, uh, as you know, again, many of our listeners probably know, a set of uh, rich theories and ideas. And these theories begin by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But the past, you know, 40 
if not longer years of scholarship and like the, the current political reality have brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation now. And that's my daughter's friend calling her on my computer. Um, so, uh, so right, so the current political reality obviously has brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation, which include race, which include class, which include ability, um, sexuality, uh, global position, and more. Okay, um, Catherine, can you slide me? Thanks. Okay, um, so this sort of leads to the most important takeaway from the sort of brief overview of our feminism, which is that feminism in the year 2020 sort of must be understood as intersectional. And actually, I feel like I should stop, shout out Susanna Morris here um, for sort of helping us formulate the statement. We had put a draft of our book online for open peer review, and we can actually talk about that later. In Q&A, we had some statement like, you know, our feminism is intersectional, we really think. And Susanna was like, isn't it the case that like feminism in 2020 or I guess so it was 2018 at that point, like has to be intersectional. And we were like, hmm, yes, that is right. Um, and so that was sort of an interesting genesis of this statement. Um, and so anyway, so, uh, you know, obviously this term, you know, it's coined by Kimberly Crenshaw um, and she uses it to explain how uh, social in inequality can't be explained by sort of one dimension of difference, such as gender. We have to be talking about the intersection of many factors and forces that produce it, right? So racism, classism, colonialism, and so on. Um, but then the key thing that we want to emphasize, and only because it's a thing that I think is often overlooked, and I think also many of our listeners maybe sort of fam be familiar familiar with how this happens. Um, but like we hear, we now see intersectionality everywhere. Um, someone told us recently that there's like, you can buy a, a tote bag that says like intersectional feminist. Um, but intersectionality, it doesn't just describe the markers of individual identity and their effects. It describes the structural forces of power and their intersection that create those effects, right? Um, and it really is the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have helped to foreground this conversation about structural forces. Um, and then also sort of the historian in me needs to sort of say that, you know, uh, Dr. Crenshaw, you know, coined the term and certainly, you know, should get all of the credit for that. But obviously the idea was described by others before her, probably most famously um, by the Combahee River Collective. Um, you know, in the late 1970s, they described systems of oppression as quote, interlocking. And then even before that, you have 19th century antecedents in the writing and activism of people like Sojourner Truth, um, Frances Harper, and Julia Cooper, right? So these were all people who described intersectionality in practice, if not by name. So in short, you know, intersectional feminism, which really provides the underlying framework for our book, isn't just about women and gender, it's about power. It's about who has it and who doesn't. And this is what lets us make the connection from feminism to data, right? Because in today's world, data is power. Um, we see this in that sort of data is the new oil metaphor. And then also in the observations um, and now written statements that data is just the same old oppression. And so our argument um, is that intersectional feminism when applied to data science can help that power be challenged and changed. So in short, we really think that data science needs feminism um, and intersectional feminism in particular, if we ever hope to overturn the power imbalances that we see in data science. Oh, wait, sorry, <laughs> hold on a second. We're not doing breakout groups. Um, oh, you know what? I think I'm showing the wrong presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak about these principles, and then I'm gonna pull up the right presentation while you're speaking next. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Real time adjustment. This is why it's helpful to co-author books. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the principles of data feminism. Um, so as we came to this work. Lauren and I um, reviewed a lot of work. We kind of came to this with a shared commitment to feminism and a commitment to bringing feminist thought into data science. Um, and we looked at a lot of prior work from a whole variety of different fields across both sort of academic fields and also activist work um, and surveyed that to think about, well, what would be the most sort of relevant design principles to bring into data science from feminism? Um, and we came up with these seven principles that for us 
encapsulate the most important aspects of intersectional feminism as they relate to data science. So the data collection, data cleaning and analyzing, data communication. Um, and so the goal here was to operationalize feminism for data science. So not necessarily to make new feminist theory, but to take existing theory and say, well, how does this work in relationship to this sort of emerging area that is, has so much power? Um, so in this way, we hope to use the principles to guide the work of people who work with data or to people who want to work with data, or additionally, and this is important for people who want to refuse to work with data. Um, and so these principles is also the outline of the book. So each principle in the book is a chapter. Um, and we go into that chapter at length and we try to present sort of by example, what does it mean to do, for example, a feminist analysis of power? Um, and we don't have time to go through all of these different principles, but today we're gonna show you a couple examples and describe a couple of them um, by example. The one thing I'll point out from this slide is just to notice that again, bringing the questions back to questions of an unequal power, we have two chapters about power. So our first two principles are examine power and then challenge power. And that, that flows sort of directly from those commitments to sort of understanding how power works in the wor world and then committing to, to challenging that. Um, okay, so let's see what the next slide is. Good, the, the next slide is correct. So as you speak, Lauren, I'm gonna load the other presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, right, so examining power, obviously we start there um, because of how gender inequality is at root a question of power. And one of the contributions of feminist organizers and activists and also theorists is to give us models that show how power actually operates in the world. Um, and we draw from, in the first couple of chapters, uh, Patricia Hill Collins, uh, who describes power as what she terms a quote, matrix of domination, by which she means that power operates not just from the top down, you know, like women saying that, women, or I mean, like the government saying that uh, women can't vote or something like that, um, but across many layers of society. Um, we go into this in more detail in the book, um, but the key point here is that once we have a model for how power works in the world, we can start to understand how it operates and how to change it. So in the book, we sort of explain the matrix of domination through the work of Mimi Onuoha, um, who is an artist and educator. And one of her projects is an effort to collect what she calls missing data sets. Um, so these are data sets that a reasonable person might expect to exist because they address issues of pressing social need, but because of various reasons, they don't actually exist in real life. So. I don't know if you can see on the right, maybe you'll be able to see really soon. Um, uh, one version of uh, Onuoha's project is a GitHub repository. You can actually, if you Google uh, Onuoha missing data sets, you'll find it. Um, and so you'll see a list of data sets like um, trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, um, people excluded from public housing because of criminal records, um, or you could even think, you know, today, like, um, you know, something very topical, like a gender and race breakdown of the number of people with COVID in the United States, like we, just, we don't have that. Um, so anyway, so one version is this GitHub repository that you see on the right. Um, but then another version is a physical artwork and it's actually a, a physical file cabinet with folders. And each one is labeled with one of these data sets. And the idea is that you encounter this file cabinet in a gallery and you tab through the folders and look at the labels. Um, but when you find one that seems interesting to you, um, you open up the folder and then it's empty, right? Because the data set is missing. And uh, in her artist statement, Onuoha explains that these mi missing data sets, quote, reveal our hidden social biases and indifferences. And by calling attention to these data sets as missing, she also calls attention to why these data sets are missing, right? They're missing because of a lack of personal, social, political, or governmental will, um, or in some cases, a combination of all of those. Or in the case of the coronavirus tests, um, uh, they're missing precisely because of uh, governmental will. Um, but in either case, since the data are missing, we can't move forward with our goal of working towards greater justice in the world. Okay, I'm gonna pass to Catherine and tell my daughter to stop talking, trying to use my FaceTime. <laughs> um, so a second principle that we'll sort of highlight here is the principle of challenging power. Um, 
And this relates directly back to the um, problem where we're sort of examining the paddle, where Mimi Onuoha was kind of pointing out these gaps, these missing data sets, the things that we're not collecting. Um, and so in fact, the, uh, the issue of feminicides in Mexico and also in many other countries is another case of missing data sets. <laughs> it's been great to have a whole family participation. <laughs> Um, um, and so in the book, um, we tell the story of Maria Salguero, um, and this is her map that you see depicted here. Um, and then she is a sort of private individual citizen in Mexico who resolved to head straight towards this problem of missing data and collect it herself. Um, so just to back up a bit, feminicides are gender-related killing of women and girls and they include cis and trans women. They're legally defined as crimes in a handful of countries, including Mexico, but the state doesn't co systematically collect data on feminicide. Um, and so they have legally defined the problem, but they actually don't, they're not quantifying the problem. They don't know the scale and scope of it. Um, and so because there's this, this sort of inaction on behalf of the state, feminicide is the subject of emerging public anger in Latin America. Um, and so you can go check this out by looking at the hashtag, ni una menos, so not one less of us, um, because of the way in which the state is neglecting to fully implement its own laws and provisions. Um, so Maria Salguero, about five years ago, was very frustrated by this lack of action and said, I'm just going to collect this myself. Um, and so she has, in the past five years or so, single-handedly compiled the largest archive of feminicides in Mexico. Uh, she spends two to four hours a day logging feminicides from media reports on this Google map. She's helped families locate loved ones. She's provided data to journalists and NGOs, and she's even been called several times in front of Mexico's Congress to testify about the, the issue of feminicide. Um, and so one of the ways that we can challenge power, that we can use data to challenge power, is things like this. So we frame this in the book as an example of collecting feminist counter data. So kind of activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed at, at some level. Um, so it represents one way to use data to challenge power. Um, one just like important thing to note here, uh, though, is that not all problems can be solved with more data. <laughs> and we wanna be really clear about that because data is really a double-edged sword. And what that means is that more data doesn't mean it doesn't always equal change. It doesn't always equal political action. More data is not always better um, because more data puts vulnerable people potentially at more risk, depending on in whose hands the, the data is stored. Um, so there are other strategies that we talk about in the book for ways to challenge power with data, including auditing algorithms, teaching. So teaching data science with intersectional feminist principles and centering equity and justice instead of ethics in data science. Um, so I'll turn it back to Lauren. Um, thanks. Um, so, uh, so feminism, it doesn't just help us identify sort of issues to address, but it also can inform the process of data science work. So um, this principle derives from a lot of people, but uh, you know, one of these people it derives from is Donna Haraway's idea of situated knowledge, um, her view that the most complete knowledge comes from bringing together multiple perspectives. Um, and in this model, knowledge is not top down, but it's created through dialogue and exchange. And ultimately this results in, a in actually a more complete picture of the problem at hand. So we see this in the example of the anti-eviction mapping project. This is the large image that you see. I'm also known as the AEMP. They are a self-described collective of, quote, housing justice activists, researchers, data nerds, artists, and oral historians. And since 2013, um, the AEMP has worked to quantify and organize around the housing crisis in San Francisco and the greater Bay Area. Um, they work in collaboration with tenants' rights organizations and community groups. And they also create oral histories, um, which is what you see here in this narratives of resistance and displacement. So each blue dot on the map leads to a video story from a single person or a, a family or a home that is facing displacement 
from where they live. Um, so in this book, in, uh, not in this book, in our book, um, we contrast uh, this approach with the eviction lab. And this is what you can see on the right. Um, that's based out of Princeton University. And the eviction lab's goal is to present a national picture of the eviction crisis. And we should say it's a worthy goal and a valuable project. Um, and actually like I've taught some of their papers in some of my classes, but it's really widely different in terms of process. Um, and this difference is probably is worth, you know, we could spend a lot more time talking about it, but it's worth pausing a little bit to think about it. So the eviction labs maps derive from seemingly, you know, bigger data, right? Like look at the picture, they've got the whole country. Um, and the map presents a seemingly more comprehensive picture of the problem of eviction in the United States. But the AMP has shown that national real estate databases, like the ones that the eviction lab uses, significantly undercount evictions. Um, you know, because they use only formal evictions rather than all the different ways that landlords can get people out of their homes, including, you know, coercion, refusing to replace appliances, you know, all sorts of things, um, loopholes in, in housing legislation. Um, and working instead with local tenants' rights organizations, the AEMP has gathered data that is admittedly messier, um, but is actually uh, much more comprehensive and more contextualized um, for the Bay Area, and it documents a greater extent of the actual problem at hand. Um, so this brings us to the last point we want to make during this short presentation, um, which is data feminism really requires an expanded definition of data science. Um, and so our argument is that data science is not about the size of the data, uh, and it's not about the sophistication of the data analysis methods, and it's also not about the technical credentials of the people undertaking the work or what elite institutions they're affiliated with. So often these kinds of uh, dimensions, like how big is your data, how sophisticated is your analysis, how many PhDs do you have from Stanford or whatever, um, these kinds of dimensions are continually used to exclude women of people and people of color from the field, as well as to exclude work whose contribution is socio-technical rather than purely technical. And, you know, the kind of the way that we arrived at this was actually through that open review process where um, a couple folks in reviewing our manuscript would look at some of the work, like the work on the bottom, which is uh, Rahul Bargov's and Emily Bargov's data mural uh, produced in conjunction with a, a food security group in Somerville that was running a community garden. And they would say, oh, this is super nice, but this is not data science. So, you know, you should write about data science. Um, and so we realized we really need to kind of say, like, actually, this is data science. <laughs> um, and we need to make sure that we push back on definitions of data science that, um, that abstract everything from the world, that disconnect things from the world, that only take that large view that you see in the, the Princeton's data visualization um, versus the, the grounded view and the view from, from the ground up. Um, and so if you kind of reframe your definition of data science, then you can see really clearly that some of the most exciting work in data science today is being undertaken by folks like journalists, artists, humanists, community organizers, activists. Um, so here we just want to give a shout out to some of that work. So Margaret Mitchell here, her papers here up on the left, um, they're looking at bias and natural language processing. Um, here in the middle, artist Stephanie Dinkins, she's pushing the boundaries and the scale of data with, um, she, this is what you see there is a talking interactive sculpture, which is trained on an inter intergenerational dialogue between black women and just her own family. And it's, it talks back to you, but it's trained on these actual conversations she's had with her relatives. Um, on the right, you see the pudding, which is this uh, data journalism outfit. Um, you see their inventive and um, frankly sort of fun <laughs> data journalism that's exposing gender bias in Hollywood screenplays. And then finally, like I said on the bottom, is uh, the group data therapies work with community-based organizations to create data murals for the community. Um, and so again, if we're going to think about feminism as something that applies not only to the output, but also to the process of creating data science, we need an expanded definition so that more people can be a part of it. Um, and this leads to just the last thing that we want to say. Um, so here are the, some of the takeaways of data feminism. Um, data feminism is data science that exposes and challenges power. 
Um, it's led by and centers minoritized people. Uh, it can be a counter data science about the injustices created by mainstream data science. Data feminism looks at many axes of inequality. So it's not only about gender and sex, it's also about race and class and many more things. Considers process. So thinking about how it's not just in like the algorithm or something. It's also like, how do we make the algorithm? Who asks the research questions? Where does the funding come from? Who gets to work on the project? Um, inequality permeates all stages of these projects. We need to think about feminism at all stages of the project. Um, and then finally, data feminism credits labor and acknowledges how data science is the work of many hands. Um, and so that's it. That, and here's all of our contact information, including links to our labs and our personal websites and our social media. And um, yeah, thanks. And we're uh, very much looking forward to questions, uh, discussion with you all. So yeah. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to encourage folks now who have been chatting in the in the sidebar to um, offer up any questions that you have, uh, Susanna Morris just said thanks for the shout outs. Love the project. So it's uh, it's been it's been really fun to see people connecting in the chat. Um, I know that we have a lot of scientists and experts who are actually in the in the room. So we would love for y'all to um, to speak up from your knowledge bases as well as you ask these questions. Um, those of you who are doing your own data science, it's always really helpful for whatever expertise you can bring into the room. Um, so uh, Becky just asked, how do you move your ideas in spaces where entrenched white cis men hold power? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that, gosh, do you have an immediate response, Lauren? I, feel like I, well, I mean, I guess I'll, one thing I will say is that we were, you know, when writing the book, we, one of our main goals was actually to speak to white cis men who hold power. Um, we really tried to be clear about the fact that the problems that we face and the sort of issues of oppression that are being reinforced and amplified by data and algorithms are not like the fault of the people who are experiencing the oppression, right? And it's not on them to fix the problem. Um, it actually is much more of, uh, you know, it's like, especially like white cis men are like, they're part of the problem, so they need to be part of the solution. So we talk a lot about collaboration and the importance of asking yourself, you know, do you believe that everyone's oppression is bound up, you know, that other people's oppression is bound up in your own? And if you believe that, then you really do need to commit from whatever your um, position may be to doing the work of affecting change. Um, and so, you know, it is true that like some people, you know, are just gonna hear that and think like, not my problem. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's tough. Um, but I think in many more cases, people think they believe that, but then aren't taking the steps to live it. And so one of the things that we tried to do in the book was to be really specific about things that you could do if you are a cis white man um, to uh, sort of work against the sort of inadvertent, we call it actually the privilege hazard in the book, sort of this idea that like, if you occupy a position of privilege, you're just not always aware of the um, inequalities or the oppression that your decisions might bring about. So these include everything from, you know, obviously like bringing more different kinds of people to the table, um, you know, but it doesn't just stop with, you know, representation among the people working on the project. Um, it also involves like listening to community groups and people who are directly impacted by some of the, especially the technical solutions that companies are trying to make. Um, it involves, again, sort of committing to the future, um, thinking about how you communicate um, both sort of the things that you are doing with data, but then also how you train up the next generation. And this could take place in the classroom, but also, you know, the people, if you are someone in a position of power in a company or a, nonprofit or another organization, how you communicate to the other people on your team, um, all sorts of things. Uh, Catherine, I don't know if there's other things you want to add to that. Yeah, I think that's great. <clears throat> yeah, I think then, then the only other thing I would say is, um, you know, I think at least for me personally, like speaking just from my own perspective, um, you know, I like to try to balance that kind of 
convincing or use that kind of convincing energy when I feel like it's a situation where people are ready to hear it as well, you know? Um, and then otherwise focus uh, energy on leading by example and kind of like modeling the kind of work and the kinds of spaces that we wanna see in the world, which are led by people of color and by women and, um, and so on and having that work be the work that goes out into the world. Cause I think it can also be really exhausting. I mean, data science and STEM fields in general are very, just white global north men dominated spaces. And so it can be exhausting to like always be in those spaces and always be trying to convince people, especially if they're not like ready to hear it. So I think just balancing that kind of um, speaking to audiences that aren't quite ready or to challenge them a little bit, balancing that work with um, the work that is sort of uh, uh, joyful and where you can really put the people um, at the center of it that you feel like should be leading everything in the first place. <laughs> so, um, yeah. we're, get, we're getting a lot of great questions coming in. So um, one from Susie Khan, uh, some people claim that data is without bias since it comes out of an algorithm, not directly from a person. How do you counter these narratives? I mean, yeah. I think just to say again and again and again, right? Like data is made by people, right? You know, even if you are creating, you know, you, you're getting data, like readouts from a sensor, that sensor was crafted by a person or a team, designed by a team, placed in the sky by in people, you know. Um, and so always to be aware of that. And then the second thing that I'll say is that just because data is created by people, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable and it doesn't give you more knowledge, right? And actually, and this is the case we make in the book, and this is the case, uh, you know, made by other people who are not us, um, just because you're recognizing that knowledge, as like Donna Haraway would say, is situated, right, is coming from a particular time and place and perspective, um, actually, understanding what that that sort of position is gives you allows you to wield the data sort of more powerfully and more accurately and more precisely because you recognize both the cases in which it can be applied with more meaning and then you also recognize the cases in which you might have been misapplying that information because you didn't understand you know for instance like is the data set missing a huge chunk of data that describes certain types of people if so you know don't apply, you know, don't apply it to, you know, humanity writ large, things like this. Um, I don't know, Catherine, a few other things to say. Yeah, just to say that, I, yeah, I think that's a really pervasive, um, I think that's a really pervasive perception, especially on behalf of people who are new to data. Um, and so like I just came to my new position from Emerson College where I was in a journalism department um, teaching journalism students how to do data analysis and visualization. And that was like a persistent, perception of data, this idea that it's neutral, this idea that it's sort of just like facts in a spreadsheet um, and that, that we're always sort of talking about and trying to push against. And one of the ways that I think it's helpful is to really put them in the shoes of data collectors. So I had an activity where we just send students around the floor of whatever like classroom that we were teaching in and tell them that they had to collect a 20 row data set about anything that they encountered. So that could have been like they could go around and catalog people's shoes. They could uh, try to ca characterize and categorize doors, uh, elevators, wall colors, posters on, on you know campus billboards, whatever it might be. But they had to do 20 rows of that thing and come up with the categories, like a kind of taxonomy of shoes or something. Um, and doing stuff like that, you know, like it, it put them in this curious position of then like they have to define well, what's a shoe, like what are shoelaces, what are the relevant categories to like break down, you know, some abstraction of shoes or something like that. Um, and we start to talk about those kinds of decisions, which in the context of shoes are pretty lightweight, but then in the context of people can become much more weighted and heavy. So I think like sort of uh, those kinds of um, ways of putting people in the body position of being the data collector and responsible for that, suddenly all the subjectivity comes to the forefront because they like have to make those categorization decisions, I guess. Awesome. Um, so Martine, who is the one of the co-founders of the Lola, and uh, which is, the Lola is one of our um, presenting co-sponsors of this event today, asked, uh, what are some of the ways individuals who are not maybe data scientists can get involved in data feminism and activism? What areas or projects need the most focus or support? Yeah. Um, that's great. Well, I mean, I guess what I would say is looking at um, 
social movements that are starting to work with data. So we talked a little bit here about the anti-eviction mapping project. So they have uh, chapters now and I think like three or four, but mostly on the coast, like New York and uh, California base. Um, but so they have different chapters and they're trying to track um, the housing crisis in multiple chapters. So you could even like start a chapter of your own, for example, if that were an area that would interest you. Um, another social movement that's making a lot of use of data is data for black lives. Um, and then there's a lot of sort of, um, there's journalistic efforts. So ways of telling journalistic stories with data, which I think can be very powerful. Um, and then there's sort of citizen led monitoring efforts. And so there I would think of things like um, monitoring of environmental health, citizen science, uh, things like this. So you don't need, um, I, I don't think you necessarily need a technical background um, in order to connect to these ideas around uh, data, counter data, uh, holding powers that be accountable. Um, Claude asks, how can designers contribute to data feminism in the design software engineering process? Do you want to take that on, Catherine? Um, yeah, I guess I, I one of my questions back to Claude would be like, which, like, wh where's the designer sitting? <laughs> like, is it a big corporation or nonprofit or whatever? I mean, I think the um, the designer's power, particularly we're talking about like UI UX designers, is really in sort of shaping a process and thinking about well, like, whose um, whose input are we collecting as part of this process? Um, and so I think one role that designers could potentially play within the context of a larger software engineering team is to push for bringing more voices to the table. So we have one of the principles is uh, embrace pluralism. Um, and so a lot of times in a design process, there are, I mean, there's always constraints of, of budget and time, but thinking about like who, like making some budget and making some time and then those are like the hardest things to move in a project and the things that actually most need to move if we're talking about bringing feminism into a design process. Um, so making some space and making some time um, and connecting with folks. And in particular, thinking about not just connecting with kind of a random public or just like the, the team's friends or family members or something like that, but really thinking about like, again, doing like an analysis of the power environment of whatever this software product is supposed to be doing in the world. I think about like, well, who stands to be most impacted or most marginalized by this? Like who stands, who faces the most potential harm from the system? And it look like directly engaging those folks in the process, even if it, and it could be lightweight, like it could be like a one hour consult or something like that. It doesn't, this doesn't have to be like they make every button decision or something, but, um, thinking about how do you build ties, how do you pay folks for their time and expertise of participating in the process and so on. So I think that would be the main, um, I think that would be the thing that would yield the most sort of influence and sort of influencing the process in a feminist way. I don't know, Lauren, if you have any other. Just to give a shout out to a new book by Sasha Costanza Chot called Design Justice, um, which came out also as part of the, the great uh, book tour cancellation of, of coronavirus. Um, but uh, their book is inspired by the Design Justice Network, which is all about doing precisely this. And there is a chapter in the book which outlines sort of similar to ours, a bunch, you know, several principles for bringing intersectional feminists and sort of more justice oriented work into the design process. And one of the things that I really like about Sasha's book is that it's based off of their experience doing this. And so the principles both sort of have the sort of like doctrinaire statement, but then have a lot of really interesting discussion about, you know, like how, you know, what does it actually mean to work with a community when you know, you're on one timeline and they're on another when the reality is that no one has a budget for anything. And so I'd really recommend that. It's one of the middle chapters, but in my opinion, it's like one of the most valuable and actionable in the book. Um, now you're hearing my other daughter. <laughs> That's great. And the whole family. <laughs> it's just, this is our reality. It's good. It, it makes everybody feel less alone in their reality. So. Uh. Um, I, so a, I don't know if a, feeling less alone is how I want to experience right now. Um, we had uh, a couple professors chime in. I'm going to condense their questions. So um, one said, our students read weapons of math, math destruction, really looked at ethical issues of the use of data, but was also quite depressing for the students. 
I would love to get our students focused on using data to help move in the right direction. Looks like your work may really help. Any recommendations or directions you can provide are very much appreciated. And I want to combine that question with um, a question from Amy Lovell from Agnes Scott. So Amy says, some of us are here from the Agnes Scott Physics Department, interested in ways to incorporate data feminism into our data science undergraduate course. What do you suggest for projects to, or data sets accessible to students to analyze? So two ways of kind of getting this into the undergraduate classroom. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll say two things and then Catherine, uh, like, let me know what you think. One is that, you know, in the book, we actually, we had it, we deliberately and tried to feature as many and as wide a range of projects that were not our own um, that we could. And so, um, so if you read the book, uh, you know, there are literally hundreds of projects doing this of all, you know, all types of projects ranging from, you know, we, I'm trying to think if we actually have some like physics-y math, I mean, I, we, we have a lot of uh, text-based data analysis projects, some more sort of um, statistically driven ones in the book. But anyway, by all means, like read the book, read the footnotes, um, and those should point you at a lot of different places. I'll say, you know, I just finished teaching a course in Emory's uh, quantitative theory methods, our essentially our data science department that was based on data feminism. And you can check out uh, in my my GitHub, uh, in my GitHub, there's a course called Feminist Data Science, and I have some exercises there. Um, in general, I drew a lot from um, sort of lightweight examples of larger systems like we did a like did a a job filtering a, a resume filtering filtering algorithm sort of based on the headlines about how these things are sexist and racist but you know we just use the example of like filtering on grades um so it's like oh you know you get the students thinking um you know clearly we want to hire the people with the best grades so let's look at the like average grades or the you know exclude the one outlier, but then you start saying, well, what about a student who shows the greatest, um, you know, transformation from freshman year to senior year, don't you want that one? Or what about if someone has a really bad semester, or do you want to kick them out? And that prompted a lot of really interesting um, conversations. And then the other thing that I'll say that really came more from the students themselves, but when prompted to look for data sets that would help them get at these questions of equity and of justice, they look to their own institutions. You know, I was prepared to give my students like, here's a data set of like all the people in the world who blah, you know, blah, blah. But they really went local and the things that they turned up were amazing. So I had student projects on the, it was like an intersectional analysis of leadership and student organizations. Someone mined the text of the Emory student newspaper and compared the, the stats on sexual assault as reported in the newspaper to the Cleary Act data to see sort of where reporting disparities might have shown up. Um, I had students look at the, Emory has like a diversity career fair where they deliver, companies come and try to recruit um, students from underrepresented groups to join their company. So they looked at like, what were the companies who showed up at the career fair? fair? Did they ever show up again on campus? Did they actually hire Emory grads? It was just super creative, super meaningful. And then the nice thing about the local data sets is they're actually quite small and tractable. Um, and so you can model them, you know, with not a ton of statistical power, but still. Um, but then they also yield really legible results. So I've been going on for a while, but that was actually like one of the highlights of this uh, interrupted online semester was my student projects. That sounds like a really powerful way to get students feeling like they have some control over their own data and, you know, how it could be meaningful in their own lives. So I think that's a great, um, a great way to start thinking about how we can incorporate these things uh, in our local communities, whether we're students or not, you know, thinking very locally about this. Um, oh, so database it, Catherine. Yeah, talk about database it. I wanted to just mention, well, first of all, I wanted to say that I think that question about giving students positive examples is so important because I think all of us need positive examples right now, actually. <laughs> um, there's been, you know, one of the, um, I don't know, kind of effects of having all this critical work about data science, which should be happening and we should be auditing algorithms and we should be sort of proving sexism and racism exist. But at the same time, it can be really disheartening and it can be kind of like this dead stop still point where you think like, oh, well, we can't do anything about this. And so I, I think it's so important to be modeling alternate ways of doing that. And just to say like, again, like in the book, that's sort of the point. So every chapter includes examples of places where we think people are 
doing it right. Like they're really embodying these principles in, in both the process, the topic, the subject matter, and the form, like what, whatever the form is that it eventually takes and where it goes. Um, so I mean, the place I would point for that is really just the book, but just to say that I think that's a really important thing to keep thinking about as we teach critically about data is that we, we can't only leave students in a place of despair. <laughs> so um, otherwise they'll just walk away and they won't, you know, can't do anything about it. Um, but then the other thing I was gonna say is um, on the data sets questions, I put a couple of resources in the chat. Um, databasic.io is a tool that uh, my colleague and I, Rahul Bargav and I developed, which are um, four uh, sort of tools for getting people, newcomers started working with data. And there we tried to choose very fun and interesting data sets and very low stakes data sets for people to start to engage with. So we like teach quantitative text analysis with music lyrics. So you can compare like uh, Beyonce and Aretha Franklin. What are their similarities and what are their differences if we're looking at it from a quantitative text analysis standpoint? Um, and there's like little worksheets and activities. So you can run these in your classroom, whether it's a K through 12 or a higher ed classroom or adult learners. We've often worked with adult learners. But, um, but so that, that's kind of a starting place. But also when we were thinking about um, designing those tools, I think this question of what data sets you use for your examples actually really matters, and it matters a lot more than we might think it does. Um, so at one point I did a presentation about how annoyed I was that all examples of um, teaching you about R use this empty cars data set, right? Like where it's like car statistics, where it's like, here's how much horsepower it has. Here's like motor something or other. Here's gas mileage. And like, who cares? Like, how do we use data sets? Or I don't care, like I should say. <laughs> that was the perspective I was bringing. Like, I don't really give a crap about cars. Um, and so I wouldn't actually be bringing any knowledge, like any intuitive embodied experiential knowledge of like working with a car or having any intuitive sense of like, what does horsepower mean to be able to like complete that analysis. So I think it's really important that we really choose data sets that you can, um, use the choice of your data set to validate people's prior experience in the world and give them a way to bring something into that analysis, to already have questions about it, to already be looking for things because they already have experience in that thing. Um, and so the last thing I'll say on that note is in the book in chapter two, we talk about this great project called Local Lotto that I think did exactly this, where they use data science to investigate their own neighborhood as well as to teach probability and uh, uh, combinatorial mathematics and things like this. Um, and it's very grounded and it values the students' prior sort of lived experience and has them bring that whole thing into their uh, data science project. Awesome. Good, thanks, Mark, for talking about me. Uh, we have a few more questions I, I hope we can get to. So um, Jen Olive asks, uh, you have a great definition for feminism that includes trans women and non-binary people. In a lot of these definitions, trans men and trans masculine individuals get left out. How do they factor into data feminism? Uh, thank you for that question. I, we, I mean, we tried really hard to be trans inclusive in how we conceived of the book and how we wrote the book. And you know, I will say, you know, like full disclosure, we thought we we thought we knew what's up, but we did a lot of learning and learned from a lot of our commenters in the peer review um, who pointed out that we hadn't been as inclusive with respect to trans issues as we had hoped. Um, you know, one of the things that it's sort of like a specific thing that we realize with respect to data and that we've tried to uh, just sort of make a point of practice is that, you know, there is when, when data is collected on gender, um, it's so much more often than not um, collected with respect to the gender binary. And, you know, oftentimes you, you know, usually you're just like a small person in the part of this large process and you get the data handed to you and you can't go recollect it, right? Um, you can't change the category, you just have it. Um, and so one of the things that we try to do, we do do in the book and we advocate for others to do is when you encounter data that adheres to the uh, sort of gender binary and is not inclusive of um, non-binary folks is to just say that. Um, you know, even if you don't have the information, just say like, you know, we based our evaluation on um, these categories and the data set did not consider non-binary folks. Um, you know, we also talk a little bit about questions of 
when you need that data, like when does it matter if someone is trans? Do you need to know that for your, for your analysis and ways to sort of intentionally and ethically structure um, uh, uh, surveys so that you are doing that appropriately? And we cite um, a couple of other people's work in this regard. Um, Catherine, yeah, I don't know if you want to jump in with more specifics. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. And um, just to say that, yeah, we're we're trying both in the book um, and I would say, in, at least for myself, in, in various kinds of research projects, I, I do um, separately do work on sort of feminist hackathons on reproductive health issues. Um, and I've also been thinking deeply about how to include trans and non-binary folks and those things which tend to be framed as women's issues. We're talking about like, menstruation, birth, breastfeeding, and so on, um, but also affects uh, trans men and uh, non-binary people. And, and so like, how do we, first of all, not use like exclusive language, like say this is just like women's health or something like that. Um, but then also how do we create um, spaces and uh, uh, tools, products, tools, whatever, um, that are like legitimately inclusive of those identities as well. Um, and so I was just saying sort of learning and growing towards that. And also that um, I feel like there's a lot more solidarity work to be done between feminist communities and trans non-binary um, uh, gender non-conforming folks to really build a solidified vision together. Um, so that's something we've been encountering in, in interesting ways when we're invited to speak to different folks and groups and things like that. It's interesting to me how still there's a good amount of feminism that doesn't see those struggles as allies, and they are. Yeah, I think as a trans person, I think my, my relationship to data is often like uh, you, you have to choose uh, whether to out yourself on a form, whether it's useful to, to to do that, whether you write yourself into the data or not, right? And sometimes that's uh, to make a point to, you know, to make yourself known, that's really helpful. And then sometimes it's like, I just want to fill out my form like everyone else and keep it moving. So I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a really interesting question how trans people interact with binary data because, and data collection um, that doesn't account for our complicated lived realities, right? So I'm always interested in how people approach that. So I appreciate that question, Jen. Um, we we have just about five minutes left and um, we've got more questions and can be answered. But um, I think uh, there's a great question. You mentioned that you are moving from ethics to justice in data feminism. Can you speak a bit more about the difference between the two? Sure. Uh, yeah, so, and it's, so saying that, does not mean that we don't want to have any ethics. <laughs> of course, like we should say. Um, in, in the book, we have a table in chapter two, um, and it has the kind of a table comparing these concepts, and we say, like, let's move from ethics to justice, let's move from desiring or aspiring to fairness to actually moving to equity, um, things like this. Um, and the reason for that is, is sort of grounded in what's going on in technical communities right now. So there's an emerging space of um, kind of area of computer science called fairness, accountability, and transparency. And so on the one hand, this is great because what this means is that there's a bunch of folks in technical fields who are working on how to make uh, interactive systems and computing systems more, more fair. Like they're really introducing these kind of social and political issues into the space. At the same time, you know, um, some of that conversation has circled only around like ethics and, and a kind of particular strain of ethics, which is sort of like dead white men from the 18th century ethics. <laughs> and so there's this idea, I mean, I'm super caricaturing, but like there's like an idea that then if we can just kind of draw from Kant or somebody and like bake in Kant's ethics into computer systems, that then everything would be fair. And so sort of the reason for a provocation around that, a reason for saying, well, this is not only about ethics, is to say, like, you can't just, like, um, resuscitate these concepts from the 18th century and then bake them into computer systems and then say, like, it's all fine, you know, there's, just, like, nothing, nothing bad's going to happen now. We actually, if we want to make fair, meaning equitable products, we actually have to think about the legacy of how we got to the unfairness in the first place. Um, and so that's where we start really seeing, well, like, 
the concepts that can help do that are concepts of justice. They're, you know, so talking about bias, which is something that like an algorithm has or a, you know, a bad, bad apple person has. We talk about oppression and we really talk about like, what does that mean if we actually understand structural oppression? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the um, provocation there. Um, yeah, Lauren, I don't know if I'm gonna say more about that. Well, I mean, only just to drive home the point that I think that, and again, I think that, you know, for people who are listening in today, this is really pretty obvious, but a lot of computational systems right, they start their design in the present. They're like, okay, we're starting now, we're gonna design moving forward, right? And I think as Catherine said already, um, but just to sort of reinforce, like this the sort of expanding the frame to justice and equity really makes you think about like what happened to get, what happened to bring us to this point where we need a system or we think we need a system that like, you know, evaluates, um, the risk of someone uh, evading, uh, you know, jumping bail or whatever. Like, why do we like? Why have we arrived at this place where, or we need we need an algorithm to um, evaluate someone's risk of you know, being a poor parent and having to call child services in? Right? Like, there is a long history that is bound up in all sorts of oppressions that have brought us to this point. And so, you know, starting looking at the broader context, I think lets us uh, take those things more into account. So um, I think that unfortunately we could, well, fortunately we could keep talking all afternoon, I think. And I think folks would continue to have many, many questions, but um, we are we are right at time. And I wanna honor the fact that uh, I know people are getting back to work and have, have many other responsibilities, many childcare responsibilities probably, homeschool to tend to at this moment. Um, but this has been really wonderful and I've really appreciated the engagement of folks in the chat and the thoughtful questions and the resource sharing. Uh, if you have a minute uh, before you have to get back to whatever your next thing is, you can go back through and look at the links um, that people have been sharing because um, everybody everybody really has been doing some great crowdsourcing of knowledge in this. So you can scroll back up and uh, and see everything. I um, want to once again draw your attention to the Buy Data Feminism from Karis Books and More link at the bottom. And if you did not uh, hear my initial welcome, um, it, the gentle reminder that uh, when you buy from us, uh, that helps Karis, but it doubly helps us because um, Catherine and Lauren are so generously donating a portion of their um, the proceeds of the royalties to Karis Circle, our nonprofit. Um, part of my job is to also um, prompt you. I'm going to put up a little button here if you would like to make a donation of any amount to Karis Circle, our nonprofit. Um, all of our work is uh, individually donor sponsored. It's how we are able to, to do this stuff and pay for crowdcasts and all these things. So any any donation of any amount really helps us. I promise I will make this um, screen bigger so that you can get everybody's contact information. Um, and the last thing I want to do before thanking our authors is thank the Lola. Uh, I'm going to put the Lola's contact information in the chat one more time. The Lola is an amazing co-working space and really like an idea lab for women and non-binary folks who want a space to connect, to um, to dream up big ideas. And I think um, if you've enjoyed sort of the, the thinking outside the box of this event, you will really enjoy the folks at the Lola. So find out more about the Lola. They are co-sponsoring a number of events with us this month and, and beyond. Um, and finally, a big thank you to both of you uh, I am, it gives me hope for our world that people like you are putting your brilliance to this, this work. Um, it's really, really, really valuable. So um, it makes me feel like we have a fighting shot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I hope that you'll both be well. I hope that everyone on the chat will be well. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to expand this one more time so that everybody can see it. I know that because of where our heads are, it may be a little hard to see. So I don't know. Um, do y'all want to just read out your contact info one more time just so folks can? Oh, sure. Um, so the best way to find me, well, my personal website is kanarinka.com, K-A-N-A-R-I-N-K-A.com, <laughs> if you got that. Um, from there, you can find me. I mean, honestly, if you just Google my name, you'll come up with all of these things. But my social media are on mainly Twitter and Instagram is where I'm at for social media. Awesome. Um, and my I, my personal website is there too. Um, I am in the process of shifting all of my uh, research groups, web things over from Georgia Tech, but it hasn't happened yet. So you can find 
the work of my lab at dhlab.lmc.gatech.edu for another probably a couple of months. Um, I'm mostly on Twitter. Um, and then I just put my personal uh, GitHub stuff and the, the Digital Humanities Labs GitHub repositories um, are also online there too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, again, this was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, final note, this will be, because this is not able to be live captioned on Crowdcast, um, what we're doing is we're repackaging it uh, and putting it up on YouTube. So um, it will immediately be available to rewatch and to share via this link, crowdcast.io backslash e backslash data feminism. Um, but for folks who are deaf or hard of hearing, just know that a closed caption version will be available on Karis's YouTube video in the coming days. Um, so please do share it when it's um, available and accessible that way, because we want it to be seen by as many people as possible. So thank you again, everybody be well, um, and special thanks to both Catherine and Lauren. This is really wonderful. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye.